She's now at the University of California in Riverside. Uh, she came there after doing a postdoc at uh, Caltech and her PhD at Rhode Island. Uh, she worked with, uh, in the past with um, Liz Ecotrell and Ed Stolper, which we know because they both gave her talks uh, uh, not too long ago. She's mostly interested in the composition, structure, evolution of Earth and other planetary bodies, uh, chemical exchanges, oxygen, atmospheres, uh, volcanism, Mars, Moon, appetite, all of my favorite things. So uh, uh, we're very happy to hear about that. Uh, I'll also say that uh, Mary Jo will also speak tomorrow at the Petrology Seminar. So that's 12.30 uh, here, and that will also be on Zoom. Uh, for those of you who are subscribed to the Petrology Seminar mailing list, so you already know that. For those of you who are interested in joining the list, uh, send me an email and I'll add you. Um, after the talk, uh, uh, after the, the talk now, so Major will stay here for a while uh, just to have an informal chat about stuff. So you're more than welcome to uh, stay. Okay, uh, and Major, I'll pass over to you. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks everybody for uh, coming uh, to hear this talk from wherever in the world you may be. And thanks so much for the invitation. This is exciting to talk about this particular topic with this particular group of um, people who thought about thought quite a lot about most of the things I'm going to talk about today. So um, in particular, today I'm going to talk about how enrichments in water and elevated iron oxidation states are linked to material recycling in Izubonin Mariana lavas. This is a subduction zone system. And I will uh, show you some data from the modern subduction zone system and the uh, early formed Eocene age system to try to make this argument for you today. Um, the photo that I'm showing you is a great photo of the UNOL's drilling vessel, the Joides Resolution, on station at Expedition 352. And I'll talk about those rocks and show you some uh, new measurements we've made um, looking at iron oxidation states as we get through the talk a little bit. Um, okay, so as uh, Michael indicated I'm interested um, in oxygen and the distribution and the activity of oxygen. Today I'm going to be talking about um, that in earth materials, uh, rocks from the earth. And I'm interested kind of broadly in, in this distribution and the activity of oxygen from the time that the earth formed, which I'm showing in the cartoon on the left hand side, where a lot of models for early earth accretion begin with the idea that iron metal is disseminated throughout the body. And then as we evolve over the last four and a half billion years, we segregate metallic iron to the core of our planet and that we uh, differentiate the silicate portion of our planet into a mantle and a crust. And then um, in the somewhat kind of recent past, we accumulate liquid water and uh, a high partial pressure of oxygen at the surface of our earth. And so I'm interested in understanding where is oxygen during all of this differentiation and why and not only where is it, but also this um, particularly, um, uh, this detail about oxygen called oxygen fugacity or the activity of oxygen uh, that varies between all of these layers. And I wanna take a minute to talk about that a little bit um, because oxygen behaves a little bit differently than most of the elements um, that we're kind of used to thinking of. And so my understanding is that there's kind of a diverse, it's not just petrologists that I'm talking to. So I'd like to just take a minute to talk about oxygen in particular. And I'll start by giving you a list of the eight most abundant elements in the bulk earth. This is from Bill McDonough's work on the topic in the 90s. And you'll notice that oxygen is on this list and it's also really high on this list. And this is a really important er uh, point, which is that in the solid earth, there is an enormous amount of oxygen bound in mantle rocks and crustal rocks um, all over the place. There, there's uh, quite a lot of oxygen in all of the rocks that we're going to talk about today. But oxygen is uh, different. Oh, I should say too, there's a like a tilde sign in front of oxygen and sulfur here, and that in part depends on how much of each of these elements you think might be in the core or not kind of affects exactly what value, exactly how much oxygen and sulfur you think bulk earth contains. Um, but oxygen is different than most of the other elements on this list in that oxygen exists as a negatively charged anion and it serves as the electronic balance to oxidized forms of the elements on this list. So for instance, we have quite a lot of uh, silicon in the solid earth, but it doesn't exist as silicon metal. Silicon metal is 
exceedingly rare. It exists as silica 4 plus or silica bound with four oxygen atoms in the silica tetrahedron that polymerizes and gives rise to the great diversity of the silicate minerals um, and silicate rocks that we have on Earth and other planetary bodies. That oxygen is hard bound to silica. It is very difficult in the conditions, uh, in, in Earth conditions, to oxidize or reduce silica away from its silica four plus oxidation state. We are also not a positively charged body uh, floating through the solar system. And so that oxygen is really hard bound and serves specifically as, as the electronic balance to the oxidized form of silica, of magnesium, of iron. In particular for iron, we can have iron two plus and iron three plus in a lot of the conditions that we're gonna be talking about today. And there's a different amount of oxygen bound there. And so anytime that that oxygen is bound to these oxidized cations, it's not available to react chemically to participate in reduction oxidation chemistry. So despite having quite a lot of oxygen bound in the solid earth, there's actually very little of it that is available for chemical exchange and to transform metallic iron to iron two plus to iron three plus in the solid earth. This is really different, of course, than the conditions that we have in the atmosphere that we're more used to, where we have much less oxygen present um, by mass in the atmosphere at the surface of the earth than we have present bound in the solid earth in the igneous and metamorphic rocks and sedimentary rocks there. But the oxygen that does exist in the atmosphere exists predominantly as the dioxygen molecule, which is extremely reactive. And it really readily reacts with elements, for instance, metallic iron and oxidizes it to iron two plus. It can oxidize it further to iron three plus. This is what when I grew up in, in Philadelphia in the United States where everything is made out of steel still. Um, and it's all rusty, right? Because there's metallic iron in the steel that gets progressively oxidized over the course of 100 years or so um, into the iron oxyhydroxide minerals that are rust to our eyes. So we have this dichotomy between the solid earth and the earth surface where there's an enormous amount of oxygen present in the solid earth, but all of it is kind of uh, actively bound to cations. It's not available or reactive. Um, and then conversely, in the atmosphere, we have much less oxygen, but what is there is very reactive, very active and available to participate in reduction oxidation chemistry. If we were to try to keep track of this, uh, the availability of oxygen or the activity of oxygen, and there'll be points today where I might say the fugacity of oxygen, it's all kind of tracking where is that available oxygen and how much of it is around. If we were to track that on a diagram like this, for instance, we're looking at the log of the partial pressure of oxygen, in the atmosphere uh, at sea level, we know that the partial pressure of oxygen is something like 0.2 atmosphere. And if we take the log of that value, we find that the Earth's atmosphere on this diagram plots over here on the right at a value just above negative one. If we were to look at rocks, typical rocks that erupt to Earth's surface um, and try to look at how much oxygen that is bound in that rock that is available for reduction oxidation chemistry, we find that it's seven orders of magnitude lower. Again, this rock is uh, an enormous percentage of this rock by weight is composed of oxygen, but again, it, it's not oxygen that's available because it has to be the electronic balance to silica four plus or magnesium two plus and so on and so forth. Um, if we were to look at the available oxygen recorded, uh, availability of oxygen recorded by rocks that erupt to the surface of the moon, for instance, they'd be even lower, four orders of magnitude, uh, even lower than rocks that erupt to Earth's surface or 11 orders of magnitude lower than Earth's atmosphere and records conditions um, similar to the equilibrium between metallic iron and iron two plus oxide or iron and wustite. And in fact, in lunar basalt, it's not uncommon to find blebs of iron metal present in the igneous rocks that are up to the lunar surface that we have sampled. Um, and I'm gonna introduce the idea of a solid oxygen buffer to use it as a reference frame today. Um, so that we can talk about differences of very small numbers here um, without having to keep track of the log scale or anything like that. And I'm gonna use the uh, quartz phalite magnetite buffer. And the idea is if you have these three minerals or components of these three min minerals in equilibrium, your uh, partial pressure of oxygen is fixed at a given temperature and pressure, uh, given the activity of quartz and phalite and magnetite in each of those phases. And it's useful because it happens to record a, a partial pressure of oxygen similar or an activity of oxygen similar to that recorded by typical basalts that are up to Earth's surface. And then I can reference to that value um, by, for instance, if I wanted to talk about the Earth's atmosphere, which is seven orders of magnitude higher on this log scale, I could say QFM plus seven. 
if I wanted to talk about uh, the moon or uh, the, the equilibrium between metallic iron and ferrous iron oxide, I could say QFM minus four or four orders of magnitude lower in uh, the activity of oxygen or the fugacity of oxygen. No, that's not uh, entirely true, but I'll use those as synonyms for the purpose of this talk today. And just keep in mind anytime that I'm talking about um, any value that follows the QFM uh, reference here as we go through the talk, just remember that it's based on a log scale. And so I'm talking about orders of magnitude difference as we move on to take a look in closer detail in this orange square about terrestrial basalts. Okay, so um, what is unique and interesting about the Earth uh, is that we have this uh, very oxidized surface condition where oxygen is very active in the oceans and atmosphere in the present day, but the interior is significantly more reduced or has these lower oxygen activities um, typically, but they're not fully isolated reservoirs like they are on other planets in our solar system uh, because of plate tectonics and the way that uh, uh, lithospheric plates and rocks are recycled uh, across Earth's surface, we end up getting physical mixing between the reservoirs um, that is uh, in parts really important chemical differences when we look at the igneous rocks that erupt to Earth's surface. And so the idea is that um, Again, this is uh, sort of a, a summary and we'll get more precise as we move on through the talk here. But in general, the Earth's interior has these uh, very, this very reduced nature. And if you collected everyone in a room that works on these problems and asked them to agree what is the partial pressure of oxygen or the activity of oxygen recorded by Earth's upper mantle, we'd agree within this range, I think, more or less QFM plus or minus three. So within six orders of magnitude, we think we know what the activity of oxygen of Earth's interior is. But we create, from this relatively reduced interior, we create the ocean floor at mid-ocean ridges at divergent boundaries here. And then in the present day, uh, that oceanic plate spends an average of 65 million years in contact with the very uh, high partial pressures of oxygen at Earth's surface and in Earth's oceans. Uh, this lithospheric plate gets hydrated it gets oxidized. We've drilled into old altered oceanic crust and oceanic lithosphere and we can see the rocks come back orange again with those iron oxyhydroxides that are typical of the rust minerals. Um, so this plate sucks up a lot of water and gets oxidized, sucks up oxygen uh, from the oceans and the surface conditions and then it comes to a convergent margin and that oceanic plate subducts. As it returns to Earth's interior and pressures and temperatures increase on the slab, there are a series of prograde metamorphic reactions that squeeze that plate like a sponge and release all of the water uh, or some of the water. The question of how much water it releases is a question, but it releases the water um, and a variety of signatures from the surface out from the plate. Uh, they rise into the mantle underneath a subduction zone or arc volcanoes and back arc volcanoes uh, and they influence the composition of arc volcanoes globally. And it was an old problem in petrology or an old observation in petrology that arc basalts have some very unique characteristics that distinguish them fundamentally from mid-ocean ridge basalts that tell us that something very different about the melting process in the mantle and the um, generation of the alteration and generation of these rocks as they move through the crust and erupt are fundamentally different than that at mid-ocean ridges. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Tomorrow I'll talk about ocean islands and how examining this oxygen activity might help us connect ocean islands to the plate tectonic paradigm on the left-hand panel that we understand um, relatively well. So uh, some of the unique characteristics uh, of arc basalts relative to mid-ocean ridge basalts that are tied directly with this physical mixing between the surface environment and Earth's deep interior at subduction zones is that arc basalts uh, prior to uh, eruption and degassing, so deep in the crust here, arc magmas have significantly higher water concentrations than mid-ocean ridge magmas do. So here's a histogram where I'm showing you the percentage of measurements made and these are kind of um, small data sets of, of kind of the sum of what we know about this. But mid-ocean ridge basalts that are up here at divergent boundaries, I'm so showing in the black bars, and you can see that they've got something like a half a weight percent of water. Some have a little bit higher, some have a little bit lower. Um, and this comes as no surprise, the upper mantle generally is dry. 
And then Arc Rocks, I'm showing you an old uh, data set here from Fred Anderson um, from the 1970s. This turns out to be a difficult measurement to make in subduction zone settings because you make a lot of melt in the mantle and it erupts. You build large volcanoes that ar arise from the sea um, and magmas typically erupt subaerially. And when they do that, water actually degasses. That's part of what we see when a volcano is, is active is the degassing of water that was dissolved in the silicate liquid at depth into the atmosphere. And so it, you can't just go pick up a rock that has erupted to the surface, a normal lava, and expect to be able to measure the water concentration of the magma at depth. So this is an early attempt at trying to make a direct observation of the water concentration of arc rocks from Fred Anderson, where he's measuring little blebs of melt inside of crystals, and the crystals act as a kind of pressure container to stop the water from degassing from those little melt inclusions. And he's measuring these uh, via uh, electron microprobe, and despite his very careful measurements, he observes that you know, it, 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 he's measuring the major elements, they should sum to 100% and they're not. And he surmises at this time that it's his low microprobe totals are due to the presence of water that he can't measure by that particular instrument. And he guesses that there's something like two, three, maybe four weight percent of water dissolved in arc rocks that are not present in mid-ocean bridge basalts. We fast forward a couple decades of analytical technological discovery and the application of new analytical techniques to old problems or old observations in igneous petrology. Here I'm showing you a FTIR and a secondary ion microprobe data set. These are now direct measurements of, of hydrogen and water concentrations in these same kinds of samples that Fred Anderson was looking at in the 70s. This is a compilation from Terry Plank that came out somewhat recently in the gray bars. And you can see that um, this initial um, hunch from Fred Anderson turns out to be true. Arc basalts have on average four weight percent water uh, dissolved in them, plus or minus two weight percent, and that's a global observation. Um, and is a, about a factor of eight higher water concentrations than we see in mid-ocean ridge basalts. Arc rocks are also enriched in some key trace element uh, ratios relative to mid-ocean ridge basalts. Um, this is an old figure from uh, Bob Kay, where he's combining a lot of data uh, from people, um, including workers from ANU that made important contributions to this problem, um, are making important contributions to this problem. And here I'm showing, for instance, that uh, arc rocks tend to have enrichments in the large ion lithophile trace elements relative to the rare earths. There's a barium lanthanum ratio on the y-axis and lanthanum samarium ratio on the x. And at this time, what he's calling oceanic uh, rocks are actually a combination of mid-ocean ridge and ocean island basalts at this time. But what you can see down here in these circles, what you expect to get out of the mantle. There's some variability that can happen with how the mantle melts and by how much and what was it before you melted? What was the composition of, or concentrations of these elements before you melted? Things like that. What you get from just the normal range of melting you expect during igneous petrogenesis uh, is down here, that it's uh, uh, very difficult to fractionate barium from lanthanum in kind of the normal silicate melting modes. And yet we observe uh, rocks that erupt at volcanic arcs have very high barium lanthanum ratios. And uh, Bob Kay at this time was suggesting that it must mean that there's physical mixing of another material into the mantle underneath of arc volcanoes. Uh, because if we were over here melting this mantle, we'd get low barium lanthanum ratios. And so we must be subducting something with a high barium lanthanum ratio from the surface, for instance, sediments from the continents subducting it into the, the mantle and mixing that into the melts that we're making of the upper mantle here underneath the arc volcano so that arc volcanoes erupt with exceedingly high barium lanthanum ratios. Again, we fast forward uh, a little bit in time, a decade or two, and uh, this technological innovation is the um, application of induced coupled plasma measurements uh, to trace element geochemistry. And this is now a data set from uh, Tim Elliott from his uh, PhD work with Terry Plank of the Mariana Arc in particular, which I'll talk about specifically here in a couple minutes. Here he is separating mid-ocean ridge basalts as triangles and the ocean island basalts as plus signs here. Again, what you can see is that what you expect to get out of normal melting has these low barium lanthanum ratios. And the Mariana Arc in particular, everything that erupts uh, from that um, subduction zone has very high barium lanthanum ratios. 
And in particular, what was interesting that Tim showed in this work is that the barium lanthanum ratios of the things subducting, so altered oceanic crust, the sediments, everything on the ocean, the Pacific Ocean plate before it subducts at the Mariana Arc have pretty low barium lanthanum ratios. And so he begins to introduce this concept of specifically, there are aqueous fluids, like water-based fluids. Um, and this becomes really important in the Marianas because if you're not just melting a sediment that itself has high barium lanthanum ratio and mixing into the mantle, uh, the only other way you can get this very high barium lanthanum ratio is by introducing a, a water-based fluid because barium lanthanum is more fluid mobile than, uh, sorry, barium is more fluid mobile than lanthanum or samarium is. And so he begins to suggest that there is a aqueous fluid separate from any melting reactions that might be happening here. Is that that seawater that the plate sucks up and gets squeezed back out down here at high pressures and temperatures. And then that aqueous fluid is basically scavenging the barium from the various materials that are subducting so that that fluid comes in and it's the same thing that gives the high water concentration is also giving the high barium lanthanum ratios in arc rocks. And so we have these very hydrous, very trace element enriched arc rocks that are directly related and generally agreed upon uh, to be related to the recycling of, of stuff that used to be at the surface back down into the mantle in subduction zones. And then finally, and the one that I'm really gonna um, uh, talk about uh, at length today is um, that arc basalts are more oxidized than mid-ocean ridge basalts. They record higher activities of oxygen. This is an old histogram from um, Berkeley's Ian Carmichael, again, um, compiling data from a lot of people, uh, mostly that worked in his lab over the course of his career. Mid-ocean ridge basalts here are the white bars of the histogram. Um, and he's showing here in the, the hatched bars, uh, the, his determination of the um, activity of oxygen in rocks from the subduction zone from the volcanic belt of Western Mexico. There's a lot of um, fairly evolved and uh, alkaline compositions that he's showing here, but if you look particularly at the basaltic andesites, the things that are most like just melts of the mantle, you can see that he's, he's showing you that they record higher oxygen activities of about um, two or maybe even three orders of magnitude more oxidized than mid-ocean ridge basalts. He's got a little bit of a different reference frame here. He's talking about, he's referencing the nickel-nickel oxide oxygen buffer, but he very helpfully points out where QFM is uh, right here. And so arc basalts are more oxidized than mid-ocean ridge basalts. And this one, um, Ian, in the course of his career, related this to the higher oxygen activity of the mantle source, presumably related to the recycling of oxidized surface materials at subduction zones. Um, but recently, in the past, um, uh, maybe two decades, 15, 15 or 20 years, this has become a little bit controversial again uh, in terms of why, explaining why. And that's because there is this persistent observation that nags at us as igneous petrologists, which is that the arc crust is significantly thicker than the crust at mid-ocean ridges. And so there's a lot more, we think about, you know, you melt the mantle, what, what can you get? What are the range of compositions and, and, you know, major elements and trace elements and redox and all of that. It's very important to consider. But then it, the, all of these magmas move into the crust and there's a variety of things that happen to the magmas as they cool down, as they leave that mantle adiabat, they start to cool down, they crystallize, they mix, they assimilate crustal materials, they degas. Um, and there's good reason to believe that some of these um, processes could lead to oxidation. So here, uh, the kind of measurements we're doing is picking up the, the rocks that erupted, just the lavas to the surface. They've degassed four weight percent of water. They've crystallized enormously relative to mid-ocean ridge basalts, and maybe that is what led to oxidation. And so there continues to be this kind of dueling hypothesis to explain why arc basalts are more oxidized than mid-ocean ridge basalts. The first being that perhaps that thick crust, that crystallization and degassing is what's driving it, uh, or like the case of trace elements and water, is it tied to recycling of surface materials, right? Is it tied ultimately to the arrival of liquid water oceans to Earth's surface and or the rise of oxygenic photosynthesis, right? Does it matter that we're creating this high PO2 at Earth's surface in order to create this kind of fundamental mode of igneous uh, rock differentiation? 
So that remains an open question. And we are going to continue on the theme of applying um, technological innovations uh, and new analytical techniques to these old observations in petrology to try to get at this problem. And um, in particular, I'm going to talk about iron zanes, X-ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy. And I know that there's a uh, bunch of uh, experts in the room, um, uh, but I'll just kind of briefly talk about what these kinds of measurements are and why they're useful just to make sure we're all on the same page. So these are, like I said, they're iron zanes measurements. These are a synchrotron facility, um, a synchrotron light source measurement that helps us get at the oxidation state of iron uh, at very small spatial scales. This is a, a cartoon a floor map of the National Synchrotron Light Source at Brookhaven National Lab in uh, New York in the US, where I made about half of the measurements that I'll show you today. And the idea is that um, you have a storage ring where you accelerate electrons around the ring to energies that are relevant to um, X-ray energies. As you accelerate the photons around in the circle, every time you change the trajectory, uh, you create a stream of photons. And so all of these kind of tangential purple lines coming off of the ring in the center are uh, photon streams. And then at the end of each photon streams, you put some piece of analytical equipment where you benefit from using the electron storage ring as the light source relative to more conventional um, analytical equipment. And so effectively what I'm working on is it's an electron microprobe and we're just taking the tungsten filament off the top of the microprobe and we're replacing it with the synchrotron storage ring. So a conventional microprobe is operating normally on like the tens of nanoamps, depending on exactly what you're doing and the storage ring at the advanced photon source where the other half of measurements that I'll talk about come from is like a hundred milliamps. And so we're many orders of magnitude um, higher beam current here. And that's gonna be helpful to us for a few reasons. So here's what the inside of the, um, the hutch where you interface with the actual analytical equipment looks like at the advanced photon source. Um, there's a plexiglass thing off on the right hand side of this camera and the photon stream when the shutters are open and you know people aren't in the room um, comes in and out of the screen at kind of a 45 degree angle like this. And I am uh, putting a sample mount in there. It's just like a one inch glass slide with a bunch of little glass chips and, and mineral chips aligned on there. And we've got um, video cameras and reflected light microscopes and then detectors. And so we're gonna bombard the sample uh, with photons of particular uh, energies relevant to elements that we're interested in. And then we're gonna watch the sample fluoresce as it moves through particular um, electronic transitions. Um, Andrew Berry has, was an early uh, leader of the application of these kinds of measurements to problems in igneous petrology. Uh, here is what an iron zanes or what several iron zanes of spectra look like of basaltic glass, uh, where he's he knows the iron oxidation state and he's showing you here. So 0.01 iron 3 plus total iron means most of the iron is, is oxidized as uh, iron 2 plus. Right, so that's 99% iron two plus in the sample and then it transitions to more oxidized values as that number increases. You can see how the shape of the full spectra changes. It's really easy to see or um, uh, maybe more obvious or more pronounced when you look at the first derivative of each of these spectra. You can see where the big changes are and how each of those uh, Zane's spectra are different from one another as a function of its oxidation state. And in particular, we're gonna focus on this area that I've uh, highlighted in a pink box here. Oh, I should say this big peak here, this is the K-alpha transition. This is the main lowest energy iron uh, uh, electron transition for iron. And so this is, this is the peak, like when you're working on a conventional microprobe and trying to measure total iron concentrations, this is the peak you're looking for. Um, so these spectra also contain information about concentration, coordination, and also oxidation state. Um, before this K alpha peak, there is a small uh, blip here because it comes before the K alpha peak or before the white line or before the edge. There's a lot of words for this region. We call it the pre-edge. And I'm blowing up the pre-edge over here to the right. Um, and these are now, I'm showing you standard glasses uh, made by Liz Cottrell in a gas mixing furnace. Um, and uh, I'm showing you known iron oxidation states from another analytical technique. This is 
Um, in this column, I'm showing you the iron oxidation state from cryogenic Mossbauer uh, measurements. And you can see now how specifically the pre-edge changes shape as the oxidation state of iron changes in the glasses. And then so if you can know something about what is the iron oxidation state, um, then you can take your unknowns, you can collect your Zane spectra, look at the pre-edge features, if you can quantify something about the shape of this curve and how it changes as a function of known oxidation state, you can create a calibration line and you can come up with known iron oxidation states um, in your unknown samples. I'm also showing you, um, so these are measurements uh, from Hung Lo Zhang uh, and Mark Hirschman and Liz Cottrell again on cryogenic moss power. And you should know that there is an ongoing conversation right now, um, including uh, Andrew Berry and other people at ANU uh, about the particular, how do we, how well do we know those iron oxidation states? And there's kind of two approaches right now to that moss power routine. And so if, um, I'm showing you what the corresponding iron oxidation states would be for these particular standard glasses, depending on which route you chose to go. Um, and I'll show you later in the talk that this is not going to impact dramatically anything that I'm talking about today. So we're, we're trying to get down into the details of exactly what iron three plus the total iron ratios um, are, but that the big changes that I'm showing you in the data set um, are still going to remain no matter which path we go. So I'll, I'll show you later um, by calculating all of my measurements in both ways um, to show you how important that is. But the great thing uh, about this new analytical technique uh, is that because we've got plenty of photons, um, we're able to, number one, see these pre-edge features, but also focus our analytical spot size down to a very small footprint on the surface so that we're able to measure at the same scale that we're making electron microprobe or laser ablation ICPMS measurements um, uh, in situ, instead of dissolving you know, large quantities of rock, we're gonna be able to get at, uh, for instance, the kind of samples that Fred Anderson and Terry Plank were looking at in order to get at dissolved water concentrations. And in particular, uh, I'm going to be talking about these melt inclusions that are housed inside of silicate minerals, in particular olivine. The reason that I'm going to do this is because if we, the goal or the strategy was to go find uh, olivine crystals from uh, the Mariana Arc that had relatively high forsterite numbers. And that's because if we can get to as high of a forsterite number olivine as we possibly can, we're trying to see through the differentiation, the crystallization, the degassing. We're trying to get at the very earliest stages of those arc magmas at depth and understand what those oxidation states are. And so if, like in the case of water, these melts are trapped inside olivine and the olivine acts as like a, a um, a pressure container or a Ziploc bag and it isolates that melt inclusion composition from all of the crystallization, degassing, assimilation, mixing that's happening in the thick arc crust. And we can measure the oxidation states of these melt inclusions. It might help us understand magmas that erupt in subduction zones at a similar level of differentiation as in the case of mid-ocean ridge basalts. So here are some photos of these little, they're basically like um, single grain thin sections um, some of these olivines are really beautifully euhedral. Uh, the melt inclusions are these kind of circular brown um, uh, uh, inclusions inside of the olivine grains. Some of them have little vapor bubbles and some of them don't. And so we're kind of catching magmas at various stages of differentiation. But again, hopefully we're getting far enough back in time uh, to be able to um, uh, look through a lot of those differentiation processes. And I'm also going to show some measurements of pillow glass. So the melt inclusions come from what we call the central island province of the Mariana volcanoes here. So Japan is north of the screen and the Bonin Islands are north on this map. And I'm going to look at melt inclusions from Agrigan, Pagan, Alamagan, Guguan, and Sirigan volcanoes. And then uh, some submarine glass from northwest Rota 1 and also the submarine flank of Pagan volcano, plus some submarine lavas from the back arc spreading center. Um, there's a set here that starts in the central part of the back arc and moves to the northern end of the subduction zone um, that uh, Ed Stolper and Sally Newman looked at in terms of water and trace element uh, compositions and some newly dredged samples from the south here. And I'll just show you the answer. So when you look at those 
um, the oxidation state of iron in those melt inclusions in very forsteritic olivines. So they're like forsterate 85, 86, 87. Um, this is what they look like. So these are from our iron zanes spectra of specifically the glass inclusions. And we find that the arc rocks have iron oxidation states on average, something like 20 to 23% uh, iron three plus the total iron. And I'm showing you a data set now of uh, within our kind of lab group, the various kinds of things we've measured. So again, the absolute value on the Y on the X axis might shift depending on um, your preferred route for Mossbauer spectroscopy, but the difference between each of these colored data sets will not change. Um, Mid-ocean ridge basalts are, are the black bars here. They have low, they have reduced iron, low iron three plus to total iron ratios. The arc melt inclusions have high iron three plus to total iron ratios even before significant amounts of differentiation can take place. And the back arc basin submarine glasses are kind of intermediate. Some of them are as reduced as mid-ocean ridge basalts and some of them are as oxidized as sort of the reduced end of the arc samples. Here's what they look like uh, relative to the other data sets that I talked about. Um, they conform to the other unique characteristic of arc basalts. So the arc melt inclusions um, have high water concentrations as well. And again, we're measuring these values in the same melt inclusions. So water concentrations by FTIR, iron oxidation states by uh, um, iron zanes, synchrotron zanes. And uh, so the Mariana arc rocks look a lot like this global compilation from Terry Plank. They've got on average four or eight percent water. Uh, the, and the, the Mariana trough, the back arc spreading center pillow glasses, some of them are dry like mid-ocean ridge basalts and some of them have higher water, more like the dry end of, of arc volcanism. Trace elements, again, they look like the uh, work that Tim Elliott had done uh, where the arc melt inclusions extend to very high barium lanthanum ratios, as high as a value of 60 in some cases. Um, and the back arc spreading centers, again, some of them are uh, uh, depleted like mid-ocean ridge basalts and some of them have kind of small enrichments in the large ion lithophile elements relative to the rare earths. And in particular, again, because we're pairing these measurements at the same spatial scale, that's the real innovation of synchrotron source uh, zanes for this particular problem is that we're able to interrogate those melt inclusions to get at the early stages of differentiation in the same way that we've been able to do water and, and trace elements for a, you know, a couple decades. And so in particular, what we start to see arise uh, when we combine these sort of um, traditionally more disparate data sets uh, is that there's a relationship. Now I've turned my iron three plus to total iron ratios into uh, uh, oxygen activity or a fugacity of oxygen here relative to the QFM oxygen buffer. Mid-ocean ridge basalts are the black circles here. Again, they've got those low barium lanthanum ratios because it's hard to get a big difference in those ratios by normal melting and they're reduced. And then as you go into the back arc, you start to see enrichments in those trace elements. You start to see maybe a little bit of an increase in their water concentrations, and you also see them increase in their iron oxidation states. And that continues right into the arc, where those arc melt inclusions are very enriched in trace elements. They're very hydrous, and they're also oxidized. And that um, you start to see that there's even maybe kind of a pseudo power law functional form to this relationship um, when you kind of collect in a sort of global way because the mid-ocean ridge basalt measurements are now from a variety of ocean basins, um, how the link between trace element enrichment, hydration, and oxidation uh, may form in subduction zones. And so we concluded uh, from this plot that subduction-related basalts, at least in the Izubon and Mariana system, become more oxidized as the result of increasing contributions of slab fluids in the mantle. And we say slab fluids again because for the Marianas in particular, the barium lanthanum ratios of most of the stuff that's subducting are pretty low. And so in order to get up here to a value of 50, 55, or 60 in barium lanthanum ratio, it really re it, it requires that there is a, a water-based and aqueous fluid of, of some kind that is specifically scavenging bar barium uh, into, and bringing it into the mantle wedge to mix with mantle melts. So this is the situation when you look at one snapshot in time. These are all effectively zero age samples. Um, the olivines are taken from tephras that are meant to be kind of the youngest tephra uh, in each of the island um, that they were sampled from. And all of the pillow lavas are nice and glassy and just dredged from the surface. And so they're also kind of effectively 
zero age on geologic time scales. So this is showing you how the oxidation state of the lavas that erupt are tied to water and trace element enrichment spatially. So as you are in the back arc here, the part of the back arc that doesn't know about the subducting slab, um, the subducting slab is too far away. The materials are not mixing. They're, they have no trace element enrichments. They have no hydration. They're normal decompression melts of the upper mantle. Those melts have low oxygen fugacities. And then as you move along the back arc to portions where the back arc knows about subduction, you begin titrating that surface influence into the mantle that melts in that area. You begin to see the increase in um, oxygen fugacity and that continues into the arc. So that's kind of spatially how those things are tied. They seem to be tied in like a one-to-one -one kind of way and that maybe the oxidizing uh, power or ef efficiency seems to kind of turn over as you get to um, high oxygen fugacities at a limit of maybe QFM plus one and a half. Um, uh, we can talk about that in detail for people where that value is close to something that would mean uh, something to you, but that, that you've got this kind of bending over of that effect uh, that as you continue to titrate more slab influence into the mantle wedge here to get increasingly higher barium lanthanum ratios, it's not accompanied by a similar increase in oxygen fugacity. So maybe there's a limit. We can also examine this in the Izubone and Mariana system with respect to time, um, because the rocks that record the initiation and the evolution of the margin are, are preserved in the fore arc and have been sampled at a, a high density uh, recently. So um, these are cartoons that I've drawn based on the work of a bunch of people. Um, uh, Mark Regan, a, a co-author, a, a colleague on this work um, in particular, where we imagine the initiation of the margin begins with the floundering of what is the um, uh, present day Pacific plate away from present day Philippine sea plate and that the mantle kind of rises um, and you get decompression melting in the earliest stages of subduction. Um, the rocks here he calls four arc basalts and they are there are some important differences of four arc basalts uh, relative to mid-ocean ridge basalts but in the broad scheme of you know what we're talking about today they're mid-ocean ridge basalt like and he calls them something different, these four arc basalts, just to distinguish in conversation that they appear in what will be a subduction setting. And these four arc basalts in this area are 52 and a half million years old. You evolve through time. Um, you start to get true down dip motion on the subducting plate. Pressures and temperatures increase. You start to get this kind of buoyant slug of material and material recycling from the surface um, begins. And you get uh, to erupt a type of rock called bonanite. Um, in a spreading center environment, we think that the upper plate is still spreading apart to accommodate that downwelling motion of the plate, and that'll be important in a minute. And that you fast forward through time today, and all of these are there in the fore arc, so that if you can um, dredge or dive in a submersible or drill into the fore arc, you can record this igneous, you can bring back this igneous stratigraphy and then learn something about the initiation of subduction margins. When I first met Mark, he had a nice collection of samples where he was building this story and some of them preserved nice glassy rinds. Difficult because they're, you know, 50 million years old and glass can alter very rapidly um, in the presence of water at the bottom of the ocean. So it requires kind of specific conditions, but he did have about 10 or 11 samples that told this story that had glass we could do these iron zanes measurements on and this is what they looked like. They plot right on the modern Mariana system. Um, so four arc basalts are kind of like mid-ocean ridge basalts or maybe back arc basin basalts in the present day. And that certainly in the time between uh, the eruption of these particular fab and what at that time we were calling the early bonanites, kind of that time difference of three million years, uh, you start that material recycling and immediately you get those oxidized rocks out the surface and that they kind of broadly conform to the same kind of pseudo power law uh, form of that relationship. Recently, though, the Joides Resolution sailed on Expedition 352 to drill into uh, the fore arc right off of the Boning Ridge here. So Japan is just off in the top corner here. And the black stars are showing you the position of particular drill cores during Expedition 352. And what's really great uh, here is that they were able to do to confirm the igneous stratigraphy so that they, they confirm that fore arc basalts are at the bottom of the pile, that the fore arc basalts transition into uh, the low silica bonanites and that high silica bonanites always overlie the low silica bonanites. So that was a really important contribution. 
And then the drilling vessel brought back a lot of, uh, they had great rock recovery. And because of the nature that we're kind of looking at rocks erupted over top of one another, um, a significant portion of them contained nice glassy rinds, despite being 52, 50 million years old. And so we have a great data set now, a much higher data density to take a look at what happens to oxygen fugacity as that material recycling begins. So here are the modern Mariana uh, rocks and mid-ocean ridge basalts that I already showed you, uh, water concentrations on the Y. Now I'm showing you magnesium concentrations on the X just to kind of verify uh, for your own interest that we do have overlapping MGO concentrations when we target those really forced aridic olivines. And so that's good. Um, when we look at the water concentrations of these Eocene aged, the initiation rocks, four arc basalts look broadly like mid-ocean ridge basalts. They are dry, they have relatively high MGO. Of course, there are some exceptions here. But the bonanites uniformly have high water concentrations like the um, kind of most hydrated parts of the back arc or the driest parts of the arc. Um, iron oxidation states, again, just confirming that an overlapping range of MGO, those modern Mariana melt inclusion samples are much more oxidized than mid-ocean ridge basalts. And then here are those initiation rocks, the four arc basalts, they are dry, they are reduced. The bonanites, they are hydrous and they are oxidized. And so we see that the bonanites erupted just 1.2 million years after the four arc basalts contained those signature high water contents and iron three plus the total iron ratios of that modern mature arc volcanism. So there's nothing stopping. As soon as you take that surface material and you put it back in the mantle and it mixes with melts of the mantle, out the top you get those oxidized rocks. Um, here are the iron oxidation states um, versus the trace element ratios. There's that kind of power law relationship I was showing you before. And here are the four arc basalts and the low silica bonanites from high and low silica bonanites from Expedition 352. Again, they plot really nicely over top of the modern Mariana sam um, samples. So not only are they closely tied, oxidation, hydration, and trace element enrichment in the modern system as you move around in space, but also as you sit still in one spot over the course of time from initiation to um, kind of the earliest evolution of the margin, also tied. So there you go, you get the similar relationship between oxidation and trace element enrichment that's recorded by the modern Mariana subduction system. And then here it is, I've taken my measured three plus to total iron ratios and now I'm showing you oxygen fugacity on the y-axis. And that's the same trace element plot where as you increase barium lanthanum ratios, it necessitates an increasing titration of those aqueous fluids into the mantle wedge to, to drive that trace element enrichment. As you do so, you oxidize the melts that come out the top. So we come back to this issue of what is the actual iron three plus the total iron ratio? Is it something like 14% or is it more like 10%? There's a couple different things that people interested in this problem should be worried about in the kinds of plots that I showed you. The first are the Zane's calibrations, um, the kind of the Andrew Berry approach to those Mossbauer calibrations and the uh, Bjorn Meesen, which is what um, Liz Cottrell and what I have been showing you for this whole talk would do. And then there's also a variety of FO2 calibrations. So how do you move from those measured iron three plus the total iron ratios to this value of oxygen activity? How do you calculate that? How do you handle those calculations? And what you get is basically uh, four possible ways that you could go about it um, in the year 2021. And here's what all of the data look like. So what you can see, the modern system, mid-ocean ridge basalts arc and, and back arc in the Marianas are still in grayscale in the background, and then the initiation rocks are still green, red, and purple. Um, and you can see these kinds of clouds of data, depending on which of these four ways you want to go, they're shifting up and down on the y-axis. The absolute value on the y-axis is incredibly important, so it's, it's, it's very important that we kind of get to the bottom of these kinds of problems, what exactly is the FO2, but I'll just point out here that the spacing um, and the relative coherence of the bonanites are like the arc rocks and the fab are like morb that that stays condition, uh, uh, that stays constant, whichever route you decide to go. And here in these delta values, I, I'm choosing a, a bonanite and a four arc basalt that have similar MGO concentrations and showing you what the um, difference in oxygen fugacity in the, for those two particular samples would be depending on which route you go. I've been showing you the top left-hand panel. Those are my own biases. Liz Cottrell was one of my PhD advisors. Um, but it's possible that 
some of these other combinations are the right way to go. Uh, so the absolute value is something that's an ongoing work in progress, uh, but the relative relationship and the coherence of fab look like morb, and those Bonanites look like the Mariana arc, the Mariana arc and the Bonanites are significantly more oxidized than mid-ocean ridge basalts or four arc basalts remains true, uh, whichever way you go about it. Um, just pointing out again that those Bonanites erupt in thin crust in a spreading ridge environment. Um, the average pressure of melt generation for those rocks uh, that John Chervais has worked on and is now available in G-cubed is just shy of one GPA, so that's about 24 kilometers depth. That's a great maximum estimate, we think, of how thick the crust was at this time, uh, kind of 51.3 million years ago in the earliest initiation of the margin. But I just show you a, a, one of the famous P wave velocity models of the Mariana Arc, um, where the mature, well built subaerial Mariana Arc uh, today has a crustal thickness of about 22 kilometers. And that we think a more realistic uh, estimate for the crustal thickness at the time of the Bonanite eruptions is more like the Mariana Trough today, which is closer to seven or 10 kilometers thick. And the point of this is uh, to tell you that this, these pressures are far too low. They preclude significant garnet fractionation, which has been a recent hypothesis for, you know, how do we drive these very oxidized arc rocks, thick crust, crystallize a lot of iron two plus barren garnet and you erupt oxidized rocks out the top. That might be an interesting story or an important part of the story for continental arcs in late stages before you're erupting very felsic, very evolved compositions, but it's not the driving mechanism for the beginning of the story. In an oceanic setting, you get at least one or one and a half orders of magnitude oxidation just out of this kind of recycling of surface materials alone. And in particular, um, there's this kind of keystone difference in the differentiation of basalts between tholeitic or iron enrichment trends that mid-ocean ridge basalts um, uh, follow versus calc alkaline or iron depletion trends. And uh, Ming Tang suggested again that this is driven by garnet fractionation and oxidation. And I just plot on this particular figure from his science paper on the topic, the Bonanites here, which again are erupted in probably 10 or 12 kilometer thick crust following this iron depletion trend that you don't need to be 50 or 75 kilometers thick um, to follow those calc alkaline trends because you can become oxidized by recycling surface materials at the beginning stages. Again, you take those uh, mafic liquids, examine like the Andean subduction system or the subduction system that gave rise to the Sierra Nevada batholith, that might drive you significantly more oxidized from QFM plus one to QFM plus two or three, but it's not the fundamental driver that elevates uh, oceanic arc basalts away from mid-ocean ridge basalts. Uh, this is fascinating to me. The Bonanites have low sulfur. So at face value, you also do not need high sulfur concentrations to generate oxidized subduction zone magmas. This is important for two reasons. One, um, in that people have speculated, so okay, we recycle the surface material, but specifically what is it? Is it the sediments? Is it the sediments are full of carbon? Is it that, that you know, the altered oceanic crust is full of sulfur? Why? What is the carrier? What is the thing that oxidizes the magmas that come up, comes off of the slab? Important as you consider how the ancient earth might have worked. Is it important that we have liquid water oceans or is it important that there's high PO2 in the bottom waters, for instance? Um, and so people have speculated that it's sulfur present in these recycling materials that is what drives the oxidation, including myself, I should say. I've also speculated that that might be the case. But the Bonanites are as oxidized here as the modern arc rocks and they have almost no sulfur dissolved in them. The other reason this is important is that there's a recent hypothesis out of Bernie Woods group that there's an important iron sulfur quench reaction that drives iron oxidations uh, right at the last moment of eruption. But that, um, that could be a small process happening for these Bonanites, but there just isn't significant sulfur present to drive all of that iron oxidation. So the two options are, uh, in my mind, that either that there's um, near quantitative sulfur degassing in much deeper water than we maybe would have anticipated, that these magmas before they erupted had significant sulfur concentrations, um, and that sulfur still is present in the subducting fluids, and those are the things that are driving oxidation, so on and so forth. Uh, or 
there's just no sulfur in these rocks because the mantle that melted to generate them was depleted of it and we've not yet turned on that metamorphic reaction in the subducting slab and that sulfur is not the culprit um, for the ancient arc and maybe not for the modern arc either. Um, important to know the difference and I just don't know the answer at this particular stage. So after uh, I started working on this problem as a first year PhD student in 2009. And so in the last 11 years, these are all of, this is the sum of the data we've been able to collect on the topic. And the statement that I've written at the top is the thing that seems to be always true. Samples with greater than two weight percent water and barium lanthanum ratios greater than a value of 10 always have oxygen fugacities at least a half an order of magnitude more oxidized than mid-ocean rich basalts. And that's true from the Eocene to the present day so here are two, two ways to look at our full data collection. Um, the map is showing you where all of these data come from. Uh, lots of sampling in the Mariana in space and uh, lots of uh, sample density in time in the, the Boning Expedition 352 samples. And I'll leave you with my conclusion, which is also the title of my talk, which is that enrichments in water and elevated iron oxidation states are linked to material recycling in easy boat and Mariana lavas. And I am happy to take any questions. Thank you very interested. much. Excellent. <clears throat> um, yeah, so people will applaud you sort of symbolically in the, uh, in the chat that's happening. You may not be able to see that. I can um, see. Yeah. <laughs> great. So that was, was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and uh, why don't I, um, I'll just barge in and carry on. Um, the, there's a question in the chat from uh, David Moll. Um, great talk. That's not a question. Any idea what might be buffering FO2, H2 at the higher barium menthium? Yeah, that's a great um question. Um, and if we go, I've kind of expanded everybody's faces. Let me move you off to the side here. Um, I sort of alluded to this uh, a little bit in the, uh, a couple times in the, you know, we, we've got, as you say, there's this seemingly buffering situation where uh, you can't get any more oxidized. The ceiling right here is at QFM plus one and a half. Um, a value of QFM plus two is meaningful for the sulfur story because this is near the FO2 that we expect a full transition from sulfur two minus dissolved in silicate melts to sulfur six plus. So it's possible that, again, if sulfur were the culprit, that you're taking sulfur off of the slab and the first little bit of sulfur you put in the melt wants to be there as sulfur two minus. And so if it's coming off of the slab as sulfate and it has to go in a sulfide and the silicate liquid, will it oxidize iron to make that happen? And then you, you know, the next aliquot is the same thing. And then as you approach a high proportion of oxidized sulfur in your silicate liquid, you start to lose the ability to oxidize iron by adding sulfur. Um, this is why the observation, the low sulfur concentrations of the bonanites is so fascinating and potentially problematic with some of the, th at least some portion of the community was pretty happily marching towards this story about sulfur. Um, if it's not sulfur, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, the thing for the water, there's some water degassing happening in, in the basalt, in the bonanites here. So you're seeing basically a, a record of a kind of similar depth of the pressure of eruption of the bonanites underneath of the overburden of the water column at that time. So the water concentration buffering is just a, a, a factor of um, uh, the depth of the ocean water that the things erupted in. That's a degassing process. The, the FO2 process is difficult to explain uh, if the bonanites have always had low sulfur. That's a great, that's like the question. That's the number one question. <laughs> um, excellent. So Andrew, Andrew Berry had a hand up in the chat. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Hello. Hello. Th thanks for the talk. Uh, i just point out to everyone who may not be aware that uh, uh, measurements of the type you're talking about are incredibly painstaking and difficult to do when you're looking at melt inclusions, these tiny samples, uh, not only is it the synchrotron experiment, the sample preparation is incredibly difficult. But, but my question, which I wanted to ask was about, I'm sure you're aware that when you have hydrous samples, that beam induced changes in the oxidation state of iron are something which is very difficult to deal with, uh, and particularly when you have small samples like melt inclusions, because you don't have a lot of material 
to move around. So, um, yeah. microbeam and a high flux. How did you establish that your Fe three plus at high levels in high water bearing samples are not an artifact of the water content? Yeah, that's a great question um, and one that gets difficult. So mo the measurements of the melt inclusions that I showed you all come from the NSLS. So we're effectively, we're working with a, a photon density on the order of like two times 10 to the second per square micron, um, which is like the dialed back version at the APS. Um, and so all of the, these are all fairly old measurements now from the kind of the end of the lifetime of NSLS. At that time, we were not confirming any of this beam. It was only when we transitioned to the APS that this, this beam induced water oxidized, right? Like all, all of the worst ways that make your glass most susceptible to the beam damage are the kind of ways that we're doing. Um, so what I can say is that the NSLS measurements are effectively what we have agreed upon. So Liz has got that American Mineralogist paper where she goes through with standards from Roman Bochkarnikov, IHPV uh, glasses, I think, um, to kind of see where is the limit, how, how much attenuation do we have to do with the APS and how much defocusing do we have to do. So the measurements at NSLS of all the melt inclusions are the same effectively as working with like a, a 25 by 25 micron spot at the APS with um, a handful of layers of foil um, so that you've got a similar attenuation. And then none of the melt inclusion, none of the APS measured, they're all glasses. So we've just got defoc big defocused spots everywhere that we can at the APS. So we don't think it, it's a problem. Um, in as much as it's possible that everything has some amount of problem in it. Um, but that that's what we're working with. It make melt inclusion measurements now are almost impossible because of the defocused spot you have to use at the APF. For people who are not aware of the NSLS is no longer open. It closed. <laughs> and as we march forward in time, this kind of story of technological innovation turns out to actually begin to get in our way a little bit because the synchrotrons get they have brighter light sources, more photons, and the kind of samples we're talking about here in subduction zones are very fragile to high photon fluxes. Uh, so yeah, because you need to be working with a 25 by 25 micron beam spot or larger at the APS, the geometry for melt inclusions is just, you know, you, you have to have 200 micron melt inclusions and those are really hard to find, as you say, <laughs> so. It's an example where the uh, advances in technology are actually making the experiments more difficult. Yeah, <laughs> it's like to freeze time a little bit, maybe make a little time capsule. <laughs> but yeah, Thanks. great question. Um, Michael Annenberg has a question and after Michael, we'll sort of move to the more informal chats, uh, conversation, question and answer, um, and let, let other people have a chance to say goodbye but anyway uh, go ahead Michael yeah so you, you talked a bit about the the fluids that come off the subduction zone into the mantle above it do we have any idea on how the fluids look like what the composition is because you showed those uh, barium and lanthanum so that's kind of the indirect evidence because how can you make it only with the fluid but do we actually have the fluids themselves from a mantle xenolith or something like that um, oh, mantle xenolith is an interesting idea. I'm not sure of that. Uh, the work I'm most familiar with is, um, well, there's a couple of things. Experimental work um, from like Craig Manning comes to mind. He tries to do these kind of high pressure fluid rock partitioning experiments. There's also some uh, famous set of experiments from uh, Kessel and Schmidt or Schmidt and Kessel. I'm forgetting the order of those authors. Uh, again, where they're trying to do uh, very difficult experiments and trying to separate the liquid right from all of the silicate stuff that you're you start with and melts that you might make and you know separating aqueous fluids in like diamond traps and or freezing the charge and then lasering the ice uh, it's difficult to get at um, experimentally the other way in xenoliths um, I'm not sure of that answer but in ultra high pressure terrains there are like remineralized uh, interpreted to be originally fluid inclusions um, in uh, from rocks from Italy, in particular, that show 
you know, you can laser the whole remineralized thing and try to get at how much sulfur or calcium or sodium or, you know, whatever you're interested in. Um, but in general, our knowledge is very limited. So the, the reason that I just keep saying aqueous fluid over and over again is because of those barium enrichments in the Marianas in particular. It really only works there because uh, in a lot of other subduction configurations, the barium lanthanum ratios of the stuff going down are high at least high enough that you could just melt that stuff and mix it with a melt of the whatever depleted upper mantle and get the same high barium lanthanum ratios. But the, the Marianas, it's a little bit of a puzzle. And so the aqueous fluid route is one way to explain that. Um, John Blundy has another kind of preferred explanation that involves accessory phases in the sediments themselves, um, fractionating, doing, doing large ion lithophile rare earth element fractionations that you wouldn't expect from normal silicate mantle melting. No mat, There's no way around it. It's always tied to the subducting slab. So I don't know that I really care which one is the right one. Um, I just feel pretty confident that the two are tied in the Marianas um, and that we're seeing kind of a, a mantle signature, a surface recycling, a grand oxygen cycle story happening. So really limited knowledge, I guess, is the answer to your question. <laughs> I can send you some papers that come to mind if, if you're interested in reading more about it, but um, a lot of uncertainty exists there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much once again. Um, so time has got, got the better of us a little bit. Um, uh, so I think what we'll do is for the, those who really are required to leave, um, feel free to do so and move into a much more sort of informal chat back and forth um, and just ask our